giving you a voice, and making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. We're very thankful for our for tonight's guest uh, to be the first team to come on to this new show, and uh, we all have a lot we can learn from them and all the success they've had. Uh, they're world division winners six years in a row and going right now. And they are 2015 world champion. Uh, this is Team 1678, the Citrus Circuits. Uh, thanks for being on here, guys. Why don't we start with a quick introduction, starting with uh, the students. And if you don't mind letting us know, uh, what are you most excited to talk about tonight? All right. Uh, hi, my name is Katie Stackwitz. I'm a junior. I am the business and media lead on 1678 Citrus Circuits. This is my third year on the team and I'm most excited to probably discuss uh, our sponsorship program. It's pretty cool. Awesome. So, hi, my name's Jishnu. I'm in 11th grade. This is my third year on the team. I'm the robot software lead. I'm probably most excited to talk about the software that we use on the team. All right. And uh, I'm Mike Crosetto. Uh, I'm the lead technical mentor for 1678. I'm a mechanical engineer. And I've been mentoring the team for about a decade now. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about uh, how we manage the team as a whole and just kind of what makes our team tick. Awesome. Super excited to get into it. Um, so we're going to start by getting to know a little bit more about 1678. Uh, later on during the show, we'll be asking some questions that were submitted by you, the community, via our uh, Discord channel, uh, Reddit, Chief Delphi, and all of our social media. And we will also take some questions submitted live in the chat. You guys can ask those right now. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask 1678, uh, post it in the chat and tag at first updates now, all one word. And we'll try to ask as many as we have time for. Obviously, there's probably going to be a lot of questions. We won't be able to get to all of them, but we're going to try to push through as many as we possibly can. Uh, we're going to jump into some questions, though, that we've kind of planned out ahead of time to, to cover some of the awesome things that 1678 does. Uh, but we're going to start out with some basics. So starting out... Uh, let's just kind of talk about how is your team organized as far as personnel, uh, different roles that everyone has, and how different aspects of the team are covered. Yeah, so our team is broken out into subteams, and there's, depending on the subteam, about 10 to 20 members per team. Um, we have sort of three main groups of subteams, the hardware subteams, which is mechanical and electrical and mechanical design. Um, and then we have software, which is, uh, which works on our scouting systems and also programming the robot. And then we have the business media, which works on um, promoting the team, uh, getting sponsorships, stuff like that. Uh, in addition to those, we call them primary sub teams. We also have two secondary sub teams, which are our chairman sub team and our strategy sub team. So students are required to be on a primary sub team. The secondary sub teams are optional and we make them optional so that, um, kit, so that students from all different types of sub teams from all different backgrounds with all sorts of different knowledge uh, can come to the, the secondary sub teams and provide different perspectives. Um, each sub team has a sub team lead, including the secondary sub teams, and all of the sub team leads combined with uh, Mike, our head coach Steve Harvey, and uh, business and media mentor Brooke Ostrom make up our leadership team. The leadership teams meet once a week uh, to discuss different aspects of the team, um, what's going on, any problems we're going we might face. Um, so that we can meet stuff head on before it even comes and discuss it with this uh, experienced group of students and mentors. Okay. Uh, anything to add? Well, just, yeah. To, or okay. yeah, Mike, go ahead. No, I was just gonna add, um, you know, Katie did a really great job breaking down what our team structure looks like. Um, and our, our team mission really is student led mentor based. And that mentor base comes from first mission um, and so our students take on the uh, really the, the, the lion's share of the responsibility on 1678. And so what Katie described is a network of students that uh, have really high responsibility levels in our team leadership. Uh, but then we have a team of mentors that are, uh, that are supporting those groups of students um, year round. 
And then it, it, even in our leadership, we have a, a you know, myself, Steve and Brooke that mentor our leadership students and support them in high level tasks that they're undergoing. And then, um, you know, we have a whole network of, of additional mentors that support on a technical and, and task based level. And then we have, uh, we additionally, our last kind of key element to our team success is our current logistics group. So we have a group of parents that are um, organizing various logistics like team meals and rides to and from events. We have a team of parents that organize uh, building our field elements every year, and they're really great at doing that. Um, so we have parents that are also supporting in really key ways. Um, and I think the the students taking on the 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 lion's share of the leadership, and then with m mentors and parents supporting their their efforts and their um, ventures, it, it produces a powerful partnership. Very cool. So a couple follow ups on some of the things you guys mentioned. Uh, the first thing was that obviously you guys have kind of well defined. Uh, roles as far as leadership and everything goes. So, you know, as far as at least for the students go, you know, does everyone kind of stick to the roles they have? Or is there a lot of crossover where you may be a leadership role for one aspect of the team, but you'll still go and work on other things. And then also you guys mentioned that you meet once a week with leadership teams. Uh, is that year round or is that only during build season? And then, you know, how often do you guys meet, you know, outside of the leadership meetings, both in season and out? I don't know who wants to cover that, but. Uh, yeah, I know that was a lot, but <laughs> I'll start by tackling the last part of that. So, okay. um, we the leadership meets off off season and build season, um, and then we take a break over summer, and okay. then may, maybe meet once or twice just to go over anything that comes up. Um, since we do a lot of outreach events over the summer, so anything that comes up with that that needs to go to leadership we might schedule a special meeting for that, but for the most part, it's a, a couple month hiatus there. Um, and then during the off season, uh, generally we meet twice a week for general, for like full team meetings. Um, uh, and then we'll sometimes meet um, extra for uh, shop training days, which I think we're gonna talk about a little bit later uh, for training new students. Um, or, or special occasions where we'll meet on weekends to prepare for an off-season competition. But for the most part in off-season, it's just uh, about two days a week. In build season, we meet a lot more frequently. Uh, we continue meeting two weekdays. Um, and then we also meet all day Saturday, all day Sunday. And um, often there are individual sub-team meetings uh, sprinkled in there on uh, additional weekdays. All right. Anybody else have anything to add or you guys want to move on? Yeah. So in the case of crossover between sub teams, so like for me, for example, I can be the robot software lead, but I usually find myself doing work from that would concern another sub team. Like I've wired part of the off season robot. And then I like to insert myself on <laughs> mechanical design meetings so that they don't do something that would be hard to program or something like that. <laughs> so you do often find yourself doing stuff that you might not be part of your role. All right, very cool. Uh, so we're gonna move on. Uh, our next question is gonna focus around um, kind of funding and how, how you guys financially uh, work. So how do you guys approach funding for your team? Uh, do you guys have a mainly sponsorship approach or is it mainly fundraising or some of both? And, uh, and how do you guys go about doing all that? So we have a, uh, a saying on the business media team that is uh, retention over attraction. We found over the years that it's specifically for going for sponsors. Um, we, it, it's much more effective to focus on retaining sponsors that are already familiar with uh, first how your team operates. Um, if they've sponsored you in the past, they, ha they had obviously a reason for sponsoring you. So it's um, much more effective to uh, reach out again to those sponsors year after year than it is to every year start new and try to um, and you know start start fresh with a brand new list of sponsors um, and contact you know ten new sponsors every year that you've never talked to before. Generally, we found that's not particularly. Uh oh, oh, we lost her. Well, somebody want to take over for her until she 
figures that. Yeah. So, um, so I'll say that, you know, while she's getting back online there, so Katie's leading our business media team and she's obviously one of the most qualified to speak to that. Um, you know, they have a, uh, a sponsor tracking sheet that gets updated every year and multiple times each year. They actually assign students to every one of our sponsor contacts and they're reaching out to those sponsors at uh, predetermined times throughout the calendar year. Um, and they're, they're doing scheduled things like they're reaching out about upcoming sponsorship for the 2019 season in the fall um, and proposing doing demos. And we do demos at many of our sponsors. But then when February rolls around, we do a open house before stop build day that, um, that our business media team invites uh, our sponsors to. And then they're inviting sponsors to the regionals that we go to, in particular, the Sacramento regional that's held right in our hometown. Um, so they have this entire program they've built up to uh, retain sponsors year round and keep our sponsors engaged. Um, Katie, are you back to keep talking about it? No more nope. Katie still. <laughs> uh, so I'll keep talking about some of the other stuff they're doing. They're doing, um, they, they have a monthly newsletter that they send out to all of our sponsors. Uh, it includes a lot of our recent accomplishments, including um, accomplishments at regional events or championships, off-season events, um, outreach events that we're doing that are impactful in the community. They develop an, a unique newsletter every month, and you can actually find an archive of all of our newsletters on our website. And that's work from our business media team that they're doing specifically to engage parents, but primarily sponsors that are interested in things that our team is doing. Okay. I think we might have Katie back, maybe. No, nope, maybe not. All right. No, well, we're gonna we're gonna keep trying to figure that out, but we can we can move on for now. Um, so we're gonna move on to talking about um, you know, Katie actually mentioned a little bit earlier um, how you guys handle training and you know educating uh, students, especially your new students that come onto the team every year, and kind of the different you know programs you guys go through to, to make that as efficient as possible. So. Yeah, so we, we basically have a list of sub-team standards that we made before we even started training them. And we, when we train, we try to go in order on those sub-team standards. And we mark students off as they meet a standard that we've trained them on. And the way we do the training so that they can fulfill those standards is through what we like to call a peer-to-peer -peer education model. So what that means is that students are teaching students. And we teach our students in such a way that they can help each other out when they come across an issue that they are having trouble with. So it's sort of like when you can either teach a guy to fish or you can tell, give them a fish or you can teach a guy to teach someone else to fish. And we like to go with the last version of that. <laughs> um, so in the case of programming teaching, we first of all teach them in an easy programming language so that they learn the basic software concepts. And then we go into uh, C++, which is what we teach uh, a higher programming in, and it's also what we program our robot in. And then we give them more projects and quizzes and tests so that we know really how good they are and we can mark them off and not be worried about them failing during build season. And our goal is that all the students will meet their sub-team standards and they'll be basically self-sufficient during build season so that we don't waste time teaching kids how to do something while we're trying to build a robot in six weeks. Yeah, so I'll, add on, I'll add on to that really quick. Um, you know, what Jishni said is great. And, and that's exactly why we do the training is we don't want to waste time during the season. We want students that come in prepared to do things that we expect their sub team to accomplish. Um, secondly, we really focus, especially on the hardware side, on safety. And so um, our students are safety trained on every one of our large machines that we have in the shop. You know, uh, there are machines that people will recognize. We have large mills, large, large lathes, uh, CNC routers. Um, we have a lot of powered hand tools. And so our students are trained on all those things. And oftentimes they're trained by veteran team members. Um, and so we, we will actually schedule additional trainings in order to get everybody through all of the necessary basic trainings that they need to be through before we get to the build season. And we have tracking systems like just you mentioned earlier, um, some, some, uh, you know, training standards that we follow and we track those standards per student in order to make sure that all of our students going into build season are ready to contribute towards our team. 
Cool. Yeah, I think Tyler Tyler earlier had up uh, like your hardware progression as far as all the different kind of lessons and steps you can take. So so you guys, that's not just for that. That's just for one subsystem of the team. And you guys have that kind of planned out for each different subsystem then? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, awesome. That's super organized. Um, all right, so we're going to move on and talk about... Oh, and we might have Katie back maybe. Okay, well, we're going to move on. Um, so, we're, you know, to kind of build off of that, and we're going to talk about kind of some of the things you guys do in the off offseason. Um, what kind of activities do you guys do? How do they improve your team and your students? And maybe, you know, some of the outreach things as well that you guys do to help your community. So we run these things called prototyping challenges, where the hardware sub team basically takes the lead on this, where students spend a meeting or two building a mechanism or a, or a subsystem that can do a specific game function from a previous year. And those subsystems have to be human powered, so they can't use motors. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, we usually spend the night just testing the mechanism out, timing people, and it's pretty competitive. And students are usually split off into smaller groups to do this. And kids usually have a lot of fun. You can hear the yelling and screaming going on from inside the shop while they're doing it outside. So, and then we also have these things called WAD pans, which stands for work all day, play, or not, play all night. So we work from nine to five, and then we play from five to nine. So we do end up spending a little bit more time working, which is always good. Um, during those WAD pans, we do things that we wouldn't normally do during a meeting, like cleaning up the shop, uh, taking inventory, uh, just work that does not directly have to do with the robot or competitive success. Um, and then for outreach, summer is a great time for that. We run these DYR summer camps. Uh, DYR stands for Davis Youth Robotics. It's one of our outreach programs. When these summer camps run for a week at a time, and then we have, I think, six to eight, depending on the summer, of weeks of camp. And, and these are kids in elementary school and sometimes in junior high, and they spend the week building VEX robots, and they're counseled by students from our team, and usually have a lot of fun. And then in the case of technical stuff over the off season, we try to test new products and systems we're gonna use on the robot, so that we can go into a season knowing that we've already tested all this stuff for their robustness, and that they're not going to fail during build season. So for this year, we're making a lot of big changes. So we're switching our electrical subsystem to CAN. So we spent the majority of the off season testing CAN stuff on robots. We switched out an entire robot to use Talon SRXs for motor control. And then we're also testing out the Limelight for vision, which is a lot more uh, streamlined and robust than the Jetson TX1, which we used in 2017. And hopefully that'll work out. So yeah. Yeah, that was a great overview. And, you know, the only other thing I wanted to hit is, you know, our team is really focused when it comes to build season on being super competitive on the field, but we really don't want that to take away from all the work that we're doing in the community. So we really try to front end a lot of our work in the community to the fall. So just you mentioned the Davis Youth Robotics Summer Camps, which is something we spend a lot of time doing over the summer. And then in the fall, a lot of the time uh, that we spend in outreach is with our Davis Youth Robotics League which is uh, VEX IQ robots built throughout the fall by teams in the community. So we have about 30 teams in Davis. Um, they're all community-based teams. So it's just parents as coaches with their kids. And then we have uh, high school students that are actually mentoring those teams on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And then we run tournaments in Davis at our high school for those teams. So we actually just finished our last tournament this past weekend on Saturday. We had 35 teams in our gym, um, most of those teams from the Davis community, some of them from out of town. Um, but that was our last one for December. And now we have a transition time while we're going to get ready, get the shop ready for the season. But we try to front load a lot of our outreach work in the fall in order to give us the time that we need in the build season to focus more on the robot we're building for, for the next season. Very cool. And just to kind of follow up, since we're talking about outreach a little bit, um, I know you guys are part of the Compass Alliance as well. Uh, do you guys want to talk about kind of the different efforts you guys put into that at all? Yeah, I'll just talk because uh, I'm, I'm in charge of leading the Compass Alliance in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time developing a lot of the resources. Uh, the Compass Alliance released uh, a new set of pathways a month or so ago, and that was really exciting. That was a lot of work actually from a lot of students on the 1678 team to prepare those pathways. 
Um, but we also have other uh, projects that are in the works for the Compass Alliance that are still to be announced. So keep an eye out for those in the coming weeks. And then additionally, there are some services that the Compass, Compass Alliance offers, uh, like our help hubs. Uh, we have a call center that's going to be live 24-7 during build season um, that teams can take advantage of, um, in addition to a couple other services. Those are all going to be live for build season. So we're helping get those ready as well. Um, to get ready for the 2019 season. Uh, Compass Alliance is something that 1678 is very excited about. We've been on board since the thing started last year, and we're looking forward to seeing where it goes. Very cool stuff. Uh, there's so much good stuff on that site. So just for anybody watching, if you haven't gone and visited it out, there's a lot of good resources on there. So be sure to check it out. Um, we're going to move on to, you know, you talked about competition season and focusing on, you know, your competitive success. So, and that always starts with kickoff every year. So kind of moving into that, how does your team approach kickoff? Um, what do your, what does your team do, you know, specifically during kickoff that you think kind of separates you from other teams uh, for the rest of the season and, and kind of you do better than most? Um, if you guys want to yeah. hit on some things. Great question. So uh, I have a whole talk on this. It's called my strategic design talk. It's the name is blatantly stolen from Karthik. <laughs> uh, if you get a chance to look at that, uh, the 2018 uh, strategic design talk is online on our fall workshops page. Just Google Citrus Circuits fall workshops and you'll find the web page and you can find that talk. But um, I do believe, and I mentioned this in the talk, that the kickoff weekend can be the most critical weekend in the team's build season. And so on 1678, we are very focused on that weekend and we aim to be as precise and as disciplined in that weekend as possible. So we break out that weekend into three portions. So we have the first portion is the rules test. All of our students pass a rules test before we move on to the next section. And so our veteran students do a blitz read through the rules and develop a rules test. And we share that with the rest of the team. And then also just last year, we started sharing that rules test with the entire first community. So if you are a student or a mentor on a first team, take a look at Chief Delphi at around 10 a.m. Uh, on the Saturday of kickoff, and you should see a rules test published, which is what our team has prepared for our own students. And you can copy that Google form, and it's an auto grading Google form that you can use with your own team to test your own students on the rules. We firmly believe that every student on the team should be an expert on the rules, uh, no matter what role they are on the team. Okay, so that's number one. And we're usually done with the rules test by 12 p.m. on Saturday. This is very specific. After 12 p.m., we start to answer the what questions. And the what questions are what, what is our robot going to accomplish? Not how is it going to do it, but what is it going to do? What is the most valuable set of tasks for a robot to do in order to meet our competitive goals for the season? And so we spend 24 hours answering this question. So from 12 p.m. on Saturday to 12 p.m. on Sunday, we spend time answering this question. And we do it through a couple of phases. Our students are presenting uh, their ideas to the rest of the team in the form of group presentations. So we divide the team up into 20 groups because we have about 100 kids. Um, and then uh, those students are sharing their ideas. And then we write all the ideas on the whiteboard. And then we spend an open amount of time discussing those ideas and trying to talk about pros, cons, and talking through different scenarios, both for qualification rounds and for the playoff rounds. Uh, and for the championship level of play, because we consider all of those in our uh, strategic design. And then by the end of lunch on Sunday, which is a day into build season, we have a list of um, what our robot will do, a list of functional requirements. And then after that, we're going into the how questions. And that's how will our robot carry out what we have determined is the most valuable set of functions for our robot. And that is where mechanism design starts to come into play. That's where people start to throw out those crazy ideas for prototypes and um, what we could look into as far as how to accomplish the various set of tasks that we've determined. Um, and then that set, of, um, that set of questions usually plays out the same way where we have the students broken up into groups and they propose various ideas and we write all the ideas out and then we start to talk through them and we identify a short list of items that we want to prototype. And then by lunch on Monday, because the students usually have the Monday after kickoff off school because it's a teacher prep day, um, by the Monday after kickoff, we have a list of items that we want to prototype 
and then the teams break off into their uh, more classical functions like Katie and Jishnu described earlier. Um, and then the students are prototyping the ideas as well as going off and uh, starting to prepare software and the various other things that need to get done. Um, and that's where the hardware team really focuses in on prototyping and trying to get ideas nailed down for mechanisms. Awesome. Yeah, just to, sorry, am I back? Yes, you are, go yeah. ahead. Just to add on to what Mike said, we have a very strict schedule that we set before build season is even close to starting. And we use the same schedule every year to keep ourselves um, on task. Generally in the beginning of the six weeks, six weeks sounds like a long time, sounds like plenty of time to get things done. And about three weeks in, it's a lot less time to get things done because you only have three weeks left and you spent about three weeks twiddling your thumbs if you don't have a very <laughs> rigorous schedule preset to make sure that you are hitting deadlines. Um, we have a motto on our team that Mike coined, or I, I think he coined, uh, called fail faster. And it's just the idea that failure is inevitable and it should be encouraged because the faster you fail, the more the the more information you'll gain of okay this doesn't work this doesn't work and this doesn't work i'm glad we figured that all out now and not the first time we got to a competition when we start a robot on the field and we realize that our auto program doesn't work because we never actually tested it or our uh, drivetrain isn't going to work because we didn't wire it up correctly and we just never thought to check so the faster you figure out for our, our motto, our idea is the faster you figure out what is going to fall apart, what's going to, you know, spark up and what's just going to break, the faster you figure out what's not going to spark up, what's not going to break. And that's how um, every every process works. The first design, the rough draft, is never going to be what makes it out onto the field. It's always a very rigorous uh, and lengthy process to get that final product. And if you don't allow yourself plenty of time for failure, you just won't get enough time to succeed. Hmm. Awesome. Um, so just because I know this is kind of a, a hot topic right now in FRC, uh, maybe Mike more specifically can answer this. Do you anticipate, uh, you guys talk about how you have, you try to stick to some pretty strict deadlines with everything. Um, do you anticipate any deadlines changing next year with the change to stop build day and everything? Or do you think you're going to kind of be keeping the same timeline? Great question. For 2020, um, I, I wouldn't honestly expect our process to change. And I'll just say because our robot design changes drastically no matter when the stop build day is. Uh, if you looked at our, uh, our reveal from last year with that wide intake and then our robot that we had at Utah, they had very different intakes. And that's uh, because we don't really hold any date to be sacred, including stop build day, when it comes to improving our robot and trying to give ourselves the best chance at success. So I really don't see our schedule changing. We're really committed to failing early, including uh, building the drivetrain early and building other mechanisms as soon as possible. So I don't see a lot of change happening. All right. Uh, before I move into our last uh, kind of question, that before we get into some of the submitted ones, just a reminder, if you do have a question for 1678 that you want to ask them uh, and have asked on the show tonight, be sure to type it in the chat and make sure you tag at first updates now so that we see it. Otherwise, we might miss it and then we won't get to ask it. So and then also don't forget, we will be having giveaways a little bit later on in the show. There's a few different giveaways we'll have. So uh, be make be make. Uh, I can't talk. Make sure you're you're paying attention and we'll have some keywords later to give those. And also, if you are a subscriber, you will get a five time chance of winning. So make sure you click that subscribe button up above if you want to support the channel. And you may have a free Twitch Prime sub available as well. So make sure you check that out. Uh, but getting into our last question uh, before we get into some of the submitted ones from the community. Uh, it's about scouting. So how does your what does your team do for scouting at events? How do you guys utilize the information you gather from scouting? and kind of just your different processes that go into that. Yeah, so in scouting, we collect two kinds of data, qualitative and quantitative. We collect most of our qualitative data on practice day before the regionals basically even started. So we have a, one or two people going around, we call them pit scouts, and they go around the pit and they collect qualitative data about the robot, like uh, anywhere from, does it look like it can play the game? How big is it? Uh, what kind of drivetrain does it have? What kind of wheels does it have? And then 
during competition, we have two kinds of scouts that sit in the stands and watch and collect data. There are the normal scouts and the super scouts. The normal scouts uh, just collect the score during the match, the what every robot's doing during the match, just quantitatively. And then the super scouts grade the robots' performance during the match, like how good is the driver? I think it's on a scale from one to five. And then all that data goes to a server and then the data is reviewed on the night before alliances are selected. And then we try to have a pretty long pick list in mind so that we can just go through it as alliance selections happen. Yeah, I'll just add on two things. One, I'll correct Jishnu on the rankings for the Super Scout because Richard's going to get at me if I don't <laughs> clarify this. Um, uh, Jishnu is the robot software lead, not the scouting software lead. So. Uh, <laughs> So the way that we rank the robots for the Super Scout is actually on a one, two, three scale versus the other two robots on that alliance. So if you imagine you have three blue robots, the uh, Super Scout will rank the best driver of the three robots, the second best driver of the three, the worst driver of the three. And they'll do the same for the other various metrics that we have for ranking robots. And what that does is essentially over the course of an entire event, it functions very similarly to an OPR calculation, and it basically takes, it, it's able to determine who the best robot is just based off of a, uh, you know, um, uh, a, a matrix across all of the matches versus all of their rankings. And so that's able to determine the best robots versus the worst robots, no matter what matches they're playing, because we're able to rank them uh, versus each other. And that makes it a little bit more uh, uh, independent of how the, you know, so the Super Scout isn't giving everyone fives or everyone ones. Um, it actually makes it a little bit more reliable. Um, the second thing I'll say is we do use our data for the pick list, and that's super important, and that's something that every team should be doing. But because we're using uh, Android tablets to input the data, and it's being uploaded after every match to a server, that means that um, I can access that data as the drive coach onto my iPhone. Uh, in the pit and what I can do with that data and what our strategist, we have a lead strategist student can do is they can take that data. And as we're like halfway through the event, now we have data from every team at the event in the matches they played and we can better formulate strategies that leverage our alliances uh, strengths and then our opponents weaknesses. Um, and so we do that uh, regularly in order to develop the best match strategies we can, which helps us, uh, try to seed number one, which is our al always our goal going into each event. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers, keeping fun loud, live, and independent. Pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now.